and the IFTA goes to John Connors. <laughs> Relax, relax. I didn't save the world. So basically, despite the fact that I can't get an angel representing me, and no filmmakers or, or cast records will look past the point that I'm a traveller, uh, this is still a huge, uh, a huge moment for me. Because seven and a half years ago, I was sitting in my house in Darndale in a little box bedroom in the darkness, contemplating suicide. That's no mess. So what's the what's the kind of response been that you've got from the speech you gave? Yeah, it's been amazing. And there's something like. Major sort of uh, famous figures that got in touch, the, like Ken Loach followed me, who was my favourite filmmaker. So it was a fanboy moment. And uh, I got a uh, message from Tyson Fury and Conor McGregor Tyson and Carl Fury Frampton. Tyson Fury as well, yeah? Yeah, yeah. What did he say? Uh, we were just talking about travellers and, you know, that we can do anything we want if we put our mind down. But do you feel there's like a pressure for you to represent your entire community when you come out and speak? Well, the speech was a spur of the moment. I didn't plan, to, I didn't think I was going to win it because uh, we were a film that was on the fringes and were, you know, weren't funded by the establishment to an extent. But in terms of like, well, when I kind of got the first kind of bit of fame, a wave of fame, about five years ago, because of the show Love Hate, I was in it's a huge show in Ireland, you know. Well, all the other actors who were in it were being asked about, you know, do you want to go to Hollywood or who would you like to work with or what type of roles would you like to tackle? Well, I was being asked to account for, you know, travel, rural crime or, or uh, any stereotypical cliche uh, utterance about a traveller. And everything was always um, political that was put at me. Um, my ethnicity was always the forefront of who I was. I was put at the forefront. And uh, no one was really interested in hearing what I say about acting or anything like that. They weren't taking me very serious. But I was always a politically minded person. Uh, I come from a long line of actors, activists. And uh, my grandmother, who would be my biggest inspiration, she was a feminist in, uh, without really realising it. And illiterate, you know, and, and uh, in the 50s and 60s, and one of you know, the greatest travel activists ever. So I grew up around that, you know, listening to her and knowing that I come from a very strong, proud family. And she's a very strong woman that still inspires me. So, the spotlight now, people listen to me. Um, so I have been using it as much as I can for the last five years. Not just about travel issues, about class issues, about homelessness, about mental health, stuff that I care about, you know. You said something I thought was really interesting in your speech. You said about the Irish Film Board that they care about awards, but you don't really care about awards. Mm. So I was kind of wondering what you do care about and what you see your success, you know, being measured by. Well, in terms of actor, I don't really care about like, what it's measured by. What I care about is getting on set and doing the work. That's where I get my satisfaction. I love being up against the wall, like with Carver Gangsters, we made the film in 15 days on a tiny shoestring budget, like a 96 page script. That was pressure to the max, but I love that. You know, so that's where I get my kicks. The recognition from your parents is nice, but it was a milestone in my life, um, just from where I came from and, and how I got into acting. And it kind of just was surreal even being an actor uh, because of, you know, if the me now told the me back then, seven years ago, that I was even just going to star in a film, I would have said, fuck off, are you, are you crazy? I never, I'd never thought I'd even get a role. I did acting just as a, you know, a sort of therapy, you know, to get a cathartic feeling. Our government is never going to do nothing about the mental health prices, our reptilian, psychopathic government, but I think creativity can be a, definitely a component to heal people. Um, and I want to dedicate this award to my father, who passed away 20 years ago this year through suicide. Just for you, Daddy. In Ireland, overall, there is a really big problem with suicide. And it seems to be something that is even worse in the traveller community. And I was just wondering if you could explain to me, from your perspective, why that has been such an issue over here. Yeah, it is really bad in Ireland, but obviously, uh, with travellers, it's where our suicide rate is seven times higher than the national rate. 11% of travellers die by suicide think it makes it the highest suicide rate in the world per capita of any group of people. But there's been a long history in Ireland of discrimination against travellers. Um, travellers have been dehumanised by the state. Long gen generations of, of, um, of cultural genocide, of taking us off the road, um, outlawing uh, nom nomadism, 
um, blocking up all the old camping grounds and still still expected to assimilate. Going to the educational system, being called knacker, pikey, I experienced that even with teachers calling me knacker, which is the worst word you can be called as a driver. Um, all this stuff makes you feel like an outsider in, in society. And then when you're um, when you're you don't have your qualifications to get employed or then when you even go for employment and you face discrimination like all this stuff really adds to the, the suicide rate you know and for you personally what was it like when you were 20 years old what could you kind of I guess paint a bit of a picture of how different things were then and where you were at in your head well I was basically in a in, in a box that I couldn't get out of that was and in the darkness and literally and, uh, and symbolically in every way, but spiritually. Suicide was my last option, I had made a decision. Like this was, this was something that was pretty dramatic actually because it was the moment I decided that I was gonna commit suicide was the moment my brother reached out to me like instantaneously. While I was in the room and I made that decision that I can't go on no more, there was a knock on the door and my brother came in and it was like a sign. Then uh, I don't know, maybe it was my father. I know people out, there's people out there who are staunch atheists and I explored that for a while when I was angry with the world. But I, I can never be an atheist because my father, the day we found out he killed himself, that day, I was um, I had a weird feeling over me. I was just eight years old. I had a weird feeling over me. That day that we found out, I was out there and I was in the back fields. I was by myself and I kept hearing my father call my name. And he, uh, my family called me Jono. Jono, Jono. And I kept, I was, kept going up to my mother in the trailer and I was like, Daddy's calling me, what's going on? No, you're, she's like, your daddy hasn't been here in a while or whatever, you know? in a few days, and they didn't know where he was or whatever. You know, people might think I'm, like, I'm making this up. This happened to me when I was a child. My mother told people about this story for years. And then a few hours later, um, a relation of ours came in with the news that my father killed himself. And that would have happened the day before. And I was hearing his voice all day. Um, so maybe in that moment, maybe there was an intervention, maybe there was a spiritual intervention, I don't know. It might sound a hokey pokey to people, but it was that dramatic the moment I decided my brother intercepted. And um, I kind of just broke down with my brother. And because my father committed suicide, it was, it was a thing that was normalized in my community. It was a viable option. Do you know what I mean? It wasn't something that, that I thought I couldn't, it was a viable option. So by the end of the conversation with my brother, he wouldn't let, you know, he just mm, forced me to change my thinking. And we Googled acting classes in Dublin. And the Abbey came up. So I rang them up and I just look, I said, I want to do an acting class. And there was this um, course, uh, Advanced Scenes 3. But it was too advanced for me. Obviously not being a, do you reckon you'd need to be a professional actor? And I assured the teacher that I could do it. And I don't know where I was getting the confidence from. I kind of just didn't give a fuck. And there's a different thing, confidence in not giving a fuck. And it's very important to not give a fuck sometimes in life, I think. Yeah, all the time, really, to be honest. Um, so I said, look, I can do it. So I went in and and uh, we, we gathered around on a stage like this and everybody explained their backgrounds in acting and that they've been acting and done three years in this school and have a degree and a master's and, and I was listening to all this and I was like, oh shit, I'm fucked there, I'm going to be out of my depth and I suddenly just lost all the confidence, you know, and I decided in my head right there and then that I was going to leave the class at the first opportunity and before I could get the chance to set up an improv game where it was about a shopkeeper and a customer. And the customer comes in the door, and whatever the customer, he or she says, the shopkeeper has to go along with it. And they improvise. And this lad who came in the door who was a customer, let's just say, would have been from a very well-to-do background, an affluent background in Dublin. And the shopkeeper who was a Brazilian man, who was a man of colour. And I watched this, this scene unfold, and the Dublin lad was like, you know, Oh, I'd like to buy some protein and this flavour, vanilla flavour and so on and so forth. But he ended up patronising this Brazilian man and I thought there was sort of racial undertones to the scene. And now, I just filled with rage looking at this. I fantasised about grabbing the Dublin guy and throwing him out the second floor building. Because the depression and anger is closely related. So when they asked for a volunteer and when the Dublin lad became the shopkeeper, I, um, I said, me, I'll volunteer. I walked outside the classroom, which you have to if you're going to do the scene, and I was outside the classroom, I was deciding whether to go now or not, instead of facing this kind of 
you know, embarrassment or potential failure. But I was so angry that superseded any other emotion. So my improv was about, I ran through the door to rob the place. And I, uh, I slapped the actor around and choked him a bit and, and uh, took his shoes off. And uh, the teacher intervened a little bit, probably too late. <laughs> and uh, you have to leave the classroom, so I left the classroom, but then I left the floor and I kept walking down. And the teacher followed me the whole way down. She was like, come back, come back, John, come back. I was like, no, I'm gone, I'm gone. This Australian teacher, Julie Shearer, who I won't forget, and a Shakespearean type teacher. And uh, I eventually stopped and she said, look, that was, uh, that was intense. That was very intense. You have something, but let's see if we can just harness it and use it in other ways and see what else you can do. Come back up. It's okay. No one's dead. Just don't do that again. Don't go that far again. So I said, okay. And it was odd because when I was walking down Abbey Street, it was a beautiful summer evening. People were looking at me. People, just random people, strangers were looking at me. And it was weird. I was like, why are people looking at me? It's because I had a smile from there to there. And it's because I didn't smile for about two years that my smile looked so weird. It was like a Joker smile, Heath Ledger smile or something, you know? So I went home that night and uh, my mother just felt me energy immediately. Like immediately, she went, what's up with you? Nah, and I told her, I said, I don't act in class, but don't tell anybody. Just kind of, you know, embarrassed maybe about some of my family, you know. And she said, please, just keep doing it. Because she's seen the difference with me immediately. And that's what creativity does you, you know? What do you think can be done in terms of kind of using that on a wider level? Do you think that it's possible for, you know, more people to kind of see you and be inspired by that? There's a huge problem with, um, with uh, working class areas and not gov the government not putting anything into arts for working class people. Um, the, if they spend any money, it's in sports or a community hall for boxing or football, because that's all working class people can be, so they think. Um, meanwhile, all the stories that are telling on stage and on film is about working class people told by middle and upper class people. And there is working class actors as well that just don't get the opportunity. And also, when they do get an opportunity, it's only to buy working class, stereotypical working class. Um, uh, characters. They would never get casted playing a middle class character, but a middle class actor will get casted playing a working class all the time. So there's that sort of bias in the industry as well. It's a very classist industry. I know it's a similar over in Britain as well. I know in Britain now that there's hardly any working class actors anymore. There was a wave in the 60s and 70s, but it seems to have gotten worse and worse now. You have the, the Cumberbatches and the this guys. Now, they're not only against them, but I mean, you know, again, they will play these working class characters. And, it's really interesting because I feel like the debate in the UK is much more focused at the moment about race. So it's really interesting to be talking about the class element of that because that is really important. And as mm. you say, that's something that you can identify very easily. In Ireland, they do anything they can to not talk about class. And it's always the underlying issue. Always is. Now, now this new form of identity politics where people are using these different groups to latch on to. Like this whole thing of straight white male. That would definitely apply in America. Like I think your skin colour in America can, you can definitely have a, an advantage for being white in America, just from your skin colour. I'm a straight white male, if you want to call me that. I hate labels, but suppose that's what I am. And I, I don't identify with being either, but that's what I am. But I come from the most oppressed and discriminated group in Ireland. And don't just listen to me, there's been academic studies by it. And not only the most discriminated against, uh, the most discriminated against by a wide, wide margin. So th th those sort of, you know, uh, ter terminologies and and um, identity politics maybe that's coming from other places. I don't think we should be applying them everywhere. Uh, in Ireland, that's definitely a problem. And it's still ignoring the, the big issue of class. Like there's no one in the media who want to talk about class. But that's not taking nothing away from, um, you know, from racism or anything like that, not at all, or, or discrimination. Sure, I'm coming from a group that I discriminate against, but it's definitely something we need to start talking about. You obviously are interested in lots of different aspects of politics. It's not just about your own community. No. So where do you, go to like find out about that stuff because you didn't go to university or anything so what quit school at 15 um, I, I did really well in primary school and I got a really high score in my exam at the secondary school or high school but then sort of cultural aspects of of, of life of traveller culture started to affect me like this attitude towards education where you're ironically considered a fool for going to get educated but in a different way, you know, and it's a pressure on men, young men to quit school and be men, become men and start knocking down boulders with their hands and all, you know. And uh, I got pressure from cousins of mine who had quit school by that age. And I ended up uh, quitting school. 
So I left that just to go to a U course. And then in the U course, I decided to do uh, metal work because I thought that would satisfy people around me that I'm manly. And all I did was uh, play ping pong all day because I didn't want to do any of the metal work stuff. I was kind of just lost, really, to be honest with you. I was just lost, lost like looking for something, really. And that's what led to the present as well was I came to a point in my life where I realised, shit, I, I, uh, I have no options. Uh, you know, I getting even interviews with jobs was hard, and when I did, they recognised I was a traveller. So I was like, what am I going to do with my life? And eventually then, I, when I dragged myself out of that, I became politically very aware of my standing in Irish society. And the fact that the Irish state has always tried to destroy my people's culture. So I said, I'm going to make an effort to preserve it. And then I just started looking at inequality everywhere. And I just think I can relate to anybody who comes from a background where they might face, you know, hardship or different obstacles. It's a worldwide thing. It's again with racism as well. It's worldwide. It doesn't matter what about the culture or the history. The results of racism is always the same. It could be high suicide rates or high unemployment or high illiteracy levels or over-representation in prison. You can apply that to any group who are being oppressed, you know. So you, you've done this speech, but you existed before this speech. You were doing lots of acting beforehand. Yeah. And, you know, you, I think you are going to have so many more things coming towards you. But what do you want to do next? I have one or two little things kind of coming up. I'm writing and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to direct now. I've directed documentary, but I've never directed drama. So I'm going to direct because there's been films made about travellers um, in this country and they've all been just bad representation of travellers. And uh, uh, inaccurate, you know. And I finally want to make the film about travellers in this country made by a traveller. Um, and I think we need that. I think, you know, if we can get, if I can get funding for that, who knows, I'll make it somehow anyway. I think once you decide to do it, you decide to do it, and you make people believe you're going to do it, then, you're, then it'll happen, you know what I mean? Because people, like, people get a, attracted to confidence and belief in a person. And uh, I'm really good at pretending sometimes I know what I'm doing. And then I'm going to do something, you know, when I don't. You know, when I'm actually unsure of myself, but I act like I'm sure of myself. And people gravitate towards me. And that has helped me a lot in my life.